All right, your video is started. Okay, let's call the meeting to order at 3.01. Can we have an approval of the agenda? Motion. So I Motion. Motion made by Tom. Motion. Second by? Second. Who seconded? Uh, yeah, I did. Who? Don. Me, Don. Don. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor signify by saying aye. Oh, wait a second. Don, I saw something on next door. Are you planning on introducing archery as a subject? Uh, what? Are you planning on introducing arch archery as a subject today? I was going to ask about it. I guess we can add that to the agenda if someone wants to. I, I, was, just trying to collect, I was trying to collect some information. I mean, a proposal was submitted several years ago about archery. So do we want to add it to discussion or do you want to leave it under comments? What do you want uh, to do? I was going to leave it under comments because it would come under budget when we start talking about budget. Okay. Seconded by Don. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Motion passed. Approval of the past minutes. Do we have a motion? Motion. Second. Tom. Second by Jim. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passed. Okay, on to vice chair comments. Well, uh, first off, uh, thank you once again to our chair. And unfortunately, she, uh, or fortunately, she did have to uh, resign with her hubby participating. So appreciate her efforts. Um, and under uh, vice chair, we have unexpired terms. We did meet um, a couple weeks ago and recommended two uh, additional members uh, to the committee. And those names, I believe, will be presented at the next board meeting. And we still have um, one or three, as I understand it. Uh, is that correct, Stacy? Three or two um, yeah, open positions? One to three, depending on the charter approval by the board. Right, one to three. So our thoughts. Uh, of that meeting where Nancy, Stacy, and I met were to open it up again to see if in fact we could get some representation from tennis, which is certainly one of our large, um, in terms of numbers and revenue uh, members, um, and also uh, possibly um, either bocce ball or lawn bowling or a combo of the two uh, because the remaining uh, candidates uh, did not have any of that type of experience. And in the past, we've had a tennis representation that was um, really positive. So we left it at that. And uh, in the meantime, we did get a, an individual who has an interest in tennis. So that was real positive. Um, I believe Stacy reached out to the tennis group as well as the bocce uh, lawn bowling group. So that was uh, our plan and uh, it seemed to have worked. And those are my comments. Uh, next up, uh, board comments. Dick, if you would please. Uh, we had a meeting this morning that you may or may not be aware of um, the, the chief thing, uh, there were two things in the meeting that, that are important, I guess, to you guys. One is that we've named a new board member. Uh, we've replaced Tormi Campagna with Chuck Alvord. And the, if you do not know Chuck, uh, I've already gotten emails. Who's this Chuck Albert guy? Well, it's Alvord, A-L-V-O-R-D. And uh, he will replace uh, Tormi for the term from now till next election. 
So he will be he will be our sixth board member. We still have one more board member's job to fill. Uh, the other uh, discussion, which was quite lengthy, and and I would urge you to watch it. Uh, because it's very complicated. I won't, I won't try to give you a synopsis other than to say that I fully support as a board member uh, Leslie and Liz's actions in getting this government loan. And, and, and we spent, I think, an hour uh, going into all aspects of, of this government loan. And if we do everything correctly, it will end up being free money. In, in other yeah. words, if, if we use it wisely and use it for uh, purposes of payroll and some utility payments, uh, and, and according to Liz, we, we can do that within the parameters of the loan, uh, that money will be forgiven. So basically, to oversimplify a very complex transaction, we're going to get three million dollars of free money. Now, uh, you know, if if you're a libertarian, you may not think that's free money, but it 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 is in essence free money, and we could really use it. So, I, I urge you it, it to watch it if you if you're that interested, but. Uh, one one person's opinion is that it's a great deal, and it's uh, it, it will help the village. Hey, Dick, I have a question. Uh, <clears throat> I watched it this morning, and uh, I, I, they're going to do an audit. Is that how you're going to determine whether you have to pay it back or not? Or how does that work? The, the government will do an audit, yeah. and. Uh, if you heard uh, Diane and, and Liz back and forth, uh, it's basically a piece of paper that you say, here's how we spent it. It's within your guidelines. We did everything you ask of us. Um, that's the audit. And again, I'm, I'm really oversimplifying uh, that situation. Okay, well, good. Does, does that answer your question? Well, it's positive news anyway. <laughs> well, it's very good news. Yeah. I think uh, I'm one person, but I, I think it's very good news. Well, I, I agree too from a board member's perspective anyway. Good. Great. Any other questions for Dick? Okay, uh, Stacy, you're up. All right, so you guys have the written report from um, recreation standpoint in terms of COVID-19 and kind of what we've done in terms of restarting our facilities themselves. Um, in addition to the report that you got, I had a couple of updates I wanted to go um, over. So I met with the Bocce Club president last week and we are gonna do a restart on Bocce on May the 17th. And those guidelines will be available on the POA's um, explorethevillage.com COVID-19 update page, uh, probably by Wednesday. Um, should have them done by tomorrow and we'll put them <laughs> out. Uh, but they're gonna restart play on 517, uh, social distancing, six feet, masks. They're gonna play every other lane going north-south and then south-north so that they can ensure that they um, um, keep that six feet of distance that needs to be done. Remember that bocce lanes are 10 feet wide. Uh, they're played as pairs. So if you alternate the lanes like they're going to do, you're able to uh, maintain that six feet distance that we have to do. Um, in addition to that, I have a meeting later this week with Connie Weider. She is the chair or the president of the lawn bowling uh, club. And she and I are going to have a meeting this week to talk about the same thing for restarting league play at the lawn bowling um, field. Um, I did want to share something with you guys. So National uh, Recreation and Parks Association have been putting out tons of stuff. A lot of it is nationwide, but there's some that, that fits well in our region as well. Uh, fully open now, 85%, 84% of all golf courses across the U.S. are now reopened for play. 
Um, and only 50% of dog parks are open right now. The CDC has put some guidelines out that says you know, there's nothing that says how dogs or pets can get COVID-19 or spread COVID-19. So there, there's some caution. Uh, let me call you back. So that's one of the reasons that uh, Mary, and you'll know this, out at the park, we have all the signs encouraging right. people to maintain that six feet of distance. Only 40% of beaches have opened across the U.S. Ours are scheduled to open on the 22nd of May. Um, that's the date that we have right now, and, and there'll be some guidelines coming out on that in the next few weeks as well. And only 40% of tennis courts across the country are open right now. Um, we were able to maintain with social distancing and court monitors to keep our tennis facility open. Basketball courts, restrooms, campgrounds, and sports, um, other sports facilities are still closed by a large majority all the way across the U.S. So while we're following that and we're following the Arkansas Department of Health and the CDC guidelines, White House guidelines, we're also a unique community. So we want to make sure that we're also thinking about we don't have a lot of kids. We don't have a lot of younger populations. So what we are doing is based on what is our population look like. So we may err more on the side of caution than some people would like pickleball players. However, our goal is to ensure that we're providing a safe environment for people to not only work, but also to be able to engage. Um, the one thing that I would say, and we talk about budgetary impact, you can see that on the statistics report that you got. 50% of parks and recreation agencies across the U.S. are now facing budget cuts. Um, a lot of that has to do with uh, reductions in spending, either in hiring freezes or in non-essential spending, also in deferring some maintenance projects. So 50% of all recreation and parks association across the country are expecting those. In addition to that, four out of five agencies anticipate a 30% reduction in their revenues at the end of 2020. So that's something that as a department, and, and Dawn talked about it when we talked about capital planning and, and, and budget, we're looking at that for 2020. They're also projecting a 20% drop in revenues in 2021 in recreation associations across the US. So that's something that we really have to look at in terms of what our budgets, what our projections, what we're looking at for 2021. So I just kind of wanted to share those two things that NRPA has been putting out. That's the National uh, Recreation and Parks Association. How do we typically compare to them, Stacy, when you use those stats? You know, they have um, on their website, they have the ability to cut that down by large metropolitan areas right. and small rural areas. They don't really, take gated communities or active lifestyle, older populations. They don't normally break those out, Holly. Um, but a lot of the times we'll mirror, but not to the extent. So if they're looking at a 30% reduction, we may see closer to a 10 or 15. That's what uh, I was thinking, yeah. In their projections or in their reductions. So if they're saying we're gonna go up 50%, we normally see about a 20. So mm -hmm. there's some change there and we always take that into consideration. Um, and we're able to really figure out what our population wants because we're so close to being able to ask them those questions. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, also this weekend, so on Friday, we'll reopen the pavilions and the DeSoto Marina. Um, pavilions will have to maintain, can't have more than 50. They'll have to sign an addendum that anyone who's renting, so their contract will have an addendum. They'll have to enforce um, the governor and the health department's directives of six foot, they have to provide hand sanitizer. So there's lots of things. So if people want to go back out and have an event at the pavilion, they can, but they're going to have to provide some things as an organization in order for them to hold those events. The marina will open on Friday, but it will be open limited hours on Friday and Saturday for fuel and bait sales only under phase one. So when we move into phase two, we can begin to look at rentals of our kayaks, paddle boards, canoes, pontoon boats, but under phase one, strict um, social distancing, that's just almost impossible for us to do and to disinfect the way that the CDC recommendations have for marinas. Um, next week, we'll be looking at opening the library, the Coronado Center, and the Washita Activities Building at Ponce. That's the only one. Casa de Carter remains closed under phase one, as does Woodlands Auditorium under phase one. 
It's not cost effective to open woodlands when you can only put 50 people in the building and the show costs $20,000. We just can't do that. Um, Casa de Carta, we can't limit that to 50. They're in and out. We can't do the contact tracing that the Department of Health wants. Um, so for now, they're going to remain closed as well. We'll reevaluate under phase two, but since um, large indoor venues just came online last week and can't reopen until the 18th, we're going to shoot for the 18th and, and just kind of see what we've got going on there. Um, we, because of those social distancing and when an organization wants to use the Coronado Center or the Ponce de Leon Center, uh, Terry and Chris, who's the manager at Coronado Center, have both been discussing with that reduced occupancy, would there be a reduction in the rental price of the facility? And so we've had that request from several organizations, one of them being the Village Players who have a play coming up in June. They can bring in less than 50 but not if we continue to charge the same rate that we've been charging, that a room normally sits 300 and we're gonna put 50 in at Coronado Center. So we're working on that plan right now as a proposal. And once we have something, um, you know, we'll, we'll put that out to those organizations. And then the lawn bowling green repair, Holly, you had asked me about this and to include this for today, do wanna let you know, we still struggle to find anybody who wants to work on, on artificial turf. Um, we have found a vendor who's agreed to come out next week to take a look at the seam repair that we need over on the lawn bowling green. We've also reached out to um, the school districts, Fountain Lake, Bryant, um, and I think even Jesseville, they have been installing artificial turf fields um, at their schools so that we can find a vendor who's willing to come out and take a look um, at the seam repair that needs to take place at Lawn Bowling. Um, we will be sending out communications with our annual pickleball and fitness center members later this week um, to talk about um, now that we're opening, now that we're into those phase reopenings, how do we uh, reimburse and or compensate for the time that we were closed and annual members weren't able to use the Coronado Fitness Center and the pickleball facility. So we'll be getting that information out early part of this week. Uh, Jason Temple convened a meeting um, and he'll have another one later this week on expansion at the pickleball uh, DeSoto Recreation parking lot, Ms. Hark. No, thank you. So we are moving forward on that. It is budgeted as a capital project in 2020. Um, it is a necessity if we are to have any sort of tournament at the same time that the pool is open and we're not under COVID-19 restrictions. Mm -hmm. The parking that we have in that facility is just not adequate for everything that's over there. So um, we, we are working on that and he has a group with streets and grounds and recreation department moving forward on that. Terrific. And then the last thing I have is later this week, I have a, a Zoom meeting to talk about event, about, uh, to evaluate events going forward for 2020. And that includes Stars and Stripes. So that's the 4th of July fireworks, as well as everything that we build around that. The 50th anniversary celebrations, there's one on July 4th. There's another one in September, figuring out how we might be able to combine those or put those into one. So we'll be working with the, the group to do that. Uh, the community challenge will make a final decision. Well, we've made a final decision on the community challenge um, and what our plan is on that. Uh, we're notifying all the organizations and the teams who had signed up for the community challenge to let them know that we're going to postpone that until 2021. We'll have more details on what that's going to look like in the next couple of weeks. And then the last one is um, any other events that we have coming up between now and the end of the year if social distancing isn't six feet, if it's three feet, or there's no social distancing and you just have to wear a mask. So we're trying to plan for things that we really don't have a good feel from Department of Health or from the Arkansas um, governor's office on what those things are gonna look like, but we're gonna continue to put our plans in place so that if this happens, then we know that we can do this so that we have all those procedures and plans in place for once when those decisions are made. Other than that, I'll take any questions that you guys might have. I have a question. Okay. Uh, well, not really a question. Could you uh, elaborate on how the uh, fitness center uh, opening uh, went, you know, as far as visitors and the uh, check-in and that kind of stuff? You've had four yes. days. The, Tom, did you want to? 
Yeah, you know, coming up with uh, committee comments, I did speak to Amy over there and things are going very smoothly, very slowly. Today, is, she said, has been the busiest day at the point I talked to her. She's had about 35 today and the largest one section group that has come on any day was probably around 15 people. She says there have been no complaints. Yeah, so Jim, what I was going to tell you is we, we have a, a maximum of loud of 30 with a 12 foot, and remember indoor is different than outdoor. We have to maintain 12 feet of space at the gym. We had to move all of the equipment 12 feet from each other. Uh, we've reduced the number of pieces of equipment from like 69 to 35, um, and they're all stored in one area. Um, we the pool's not open yet, although we did get a directive on Friday from the governor's office that we could reopen the pool on May 22nd but we still haven't been given any directives on showers. So you can come to the pool, but you can't take a shower. You can't go into the locker rooms. You can't, you know, so, so we're still waiting on some qualifications from the Department of Health to figure out whether or not we'll be able to actually open the indoor pool on May 22nd. We have requested a date for inspection on the outdoor pool, but we haven't heard from the Department of Health when that inspection date will take place. We can reopen the indoor pool anytime we can meet the qualifications from the Department of Health, but we can't reopen or we can't open the outdoor pool because it's never been a licensed facility until they're able to schedule us. To she seems to think that we could still probably open before the end of May, but possibly not before Memorial Day. We're still gonna you know, get everything ready to open. Uh, Memorial Day is the 25th, and she's thinking well, we may be closer to the 30th or 31st of May. Yeah, I was just curious how many people showed up and how it went. You know, I, I, I knew all the other stuff, but I was just curious. Sounds like you had a good turnout. It's been slow, but this is only our third day back, so. Yeah, so. Well, I went to down. I didn't play pickleball, but I went down there by the pickleball court uh, on Friday. Of course, it rained early in the morning, and uh, at noon when I was there, they uh, wasn't, wasn't a lot of people there, but there were two courts playing, and uh, they were uh, the people sitting on the benches. There was one per bench, you know, like they were supposed to. So that seemed to be going pretty well. Uh, I went by there on Saturday about noon, and there were about twenty people there. Um, yeah. and they were playing, they were socially distancing, they were doing what we had asked them to do in order to, to keep that facility good. open, so. Holly, did you play? Yeah, I've played three days. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, when we get to pickleball, I'll, I'll talk about it. Um, Stacy, the um, pavilions, have you moved tables or anything, or are you just, you know, are those appropriately placed? I'm just um, concerned if we're, you know, requiring, I mean, social distance is required and are they lined up okay? They're not. And that's why I said they're not opening until Friday. So but you're planning to do that, right? Yeah, we're planning to do that. And okay. take all your hand up, so I'll grab you in just a second. But Holly, on, on the pavilions, we are planning on, on moving those picnic tables. And you yeah. know, that's a challenge for us. They're eight foot. There's really no place to store them. And then I'm afraid if I move them out of there, someone will take off with them. Uh, so those are all the things that we're working out in the procedures for reopening the pavilions. So, Tammy, I know you had a question. The swimming lessons this summer, have y'all, I mean, I know we're in a total state of uncertainty, but indoor, outdoor, June, July. It, I'll be honest with you, Tammy, with every, case. yeah, with everything else going on, that has not made it to the top of my list yet. I do apologize. We, I mean, it's part of our events. It's part of our event planning, especially our summer youth planning. But it's just not something that we can even contemplate right now because if you can't get within six feet of somebody, you can't teach an adult or a kid to swim because you have to touch them. And so until we get probably past phase three or at least within phase three, I don't see us offering lessons. Okay. Um, sorry, I had a question. Yeah. Um, did I understand, are you going to try to make a recommendation on the July 4th within the next two weeks? Is that... I actually hope to have a recommendation on July 4th by Friday. So I have a by meeting the, later this week. By um, the end of and, this week? Yeah. Okay. Is it the events meeting? Important. Or is it... 
I think that's important for families to be able to plan for vacation to know whether or not, you know, that's 4th of July, Stars and Stripes, and you guys know this, but uh, Stars and Stripes cost us about $20,000 every year. We have a contract on the fireworks, which is include, we're outside of the cancellation date, which is 120 days. And 120 days ago, we didn't know there was a COVID-19. Um, and so one of the things that we're talking with our vendor, Don, is to see if, if you know, social distancing doesn't allow us to put 4,000 people on the beach in two months, can we move those fireworks somewhere else, you know, uh, another date um, within the same contract? Right. And so um, they have been very receptive to that. They're just kind of looking for a date from us if we were to move it from July 4th. Would we still try to do it in 2020? Or would we cancel it all together? That's the discussion that we're going to be having later this week. Yeah, of course, my interest is or what we're going to do about the kids fishing derby, because we have plans to make, uh, you know, in process there. Well, and I'll know that by Friday, Dawn. What I can tell you is in our initial conversations, we feel like we could very easily socially distance the kids fishing derby, the right. mini golf tournament, because they can play within family groups. They just right. need to be six feet from somewhere else. So where we might not have fireworks for Stars and Stripes, and we haven't made that decision yet, while we might not have fireworks, we could certainly still do other things that could be um, around that weekend that could be socially distanced and allow families to be able to enjoy okay. the Independence Day together. Because they seem to be doing a pretty good job on the beach at Balboa, for the most part. When I've been by there, there's family groups, uh, even when it's been crowded, the family group's been separated. Days they do really good and days they need a little bit more instruction. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a few, but it's been yeah. pretty good. And uh, the other, now what did you, did you say you were looking at opening the outdoor pool by the, by the 25th? It, it, so. so we're hoping to have the outdoor pool open before the end of May, but on that one, we have to wait on the Arkansas Department of Health for an inspection. They um, not given us a date for inspection yet. For inspection. But you said it might be the 30th, 31st, didn't you? Um, uh, our contact with the Department of Health has told us yeah. that it's much more likely we would be at the end of May than and we would be closer to Memorial Day. So she, so in my mind, it's for me, it's more around May 30th than it is around May 22nd. And Stacy, right now, lawn bowling and bocce are open. What you were talking about was starting up leagues. Is that right? Yeah, so they've been available for individuals to go out yeah. and use okay. the lanes and use the green, you know, away from everyone else. But there's no league play, no group play right. at bocce or lawn bowling. Okay. Any other questions for Stacy? No. Okay, let's move on to uh, committee comments. Uh, Tom? I said what I had to say. <clears throat> Serena? I have nothing, thank you. Tammy? I have nothing. Well, I do have one question. The Coronado Center, you said y'all were gonna meet on that and talk about how you were gonna social distance and, and what was gonna be required of the room and what you're going to set the um, attendance limit at for each room. <coughs> yeah, so the staff, was, the staff has measured all of the rooms at Coronado Center. We know, and at Pond Center, we know what those rooms can seat with a six foot social distance in both a classroom style and in a theater style. Um, and we'll have those regulations out on the website later this week under that COVID-19 pledge so that organizations who want to begin meeting again can see how many people they can fit in each of the different spaces. We'll also include on that whether or not we can reduce the cost of those rooms because we're reducing the number of people that you can get in them. And there'll be masks required and hand sanitizer. Will that be the clubs or the groups that provide it or just generally at the center or do you know yet? So the facility is required by the health department directive to provide the hand sanitizer, but the mask will be required by each individual in order to, to enter the building. Okay. Uh, 
Don? Uh, yeah, well, a couple of things, but uh, I had asked a group of the anglers about um, their uh, thoughts on us having uh, an archery field, or and, and we've this proposal was made five, six, five years ago, right? Uh, Stacy, I think it was. I even submitted it in in the old CMP format, so you know I, I went to a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I ha I yeah. still have your proposal, Don. <laughs> uh, we still have the proposal there, and it and it did make the budget. What two years ago, it finally was got put on the budget horizon. Yes. But it keeps getting pushed out every year, so you know it just keeps moving out. And so I asked the group, you know, what the level of interest was. And I guess I, I had a, a distribution list of about uh, oh, 60, 65 people that I sent an email out to and asked them to just, you know, let me know what their thoughts were. Well, I quickly got 13 emails in response, uh, all positive. I, I've got a, and that was within 24 hours. I, I sent it out Friday night or I think. Um, and then I've had several more since then, and, and then some verbal responses. So I feel there's a great deal of interest in it. And I, I guess, you know, part of the issue there is that we, we keep looking at things, and I see on the agenda, we're looking at croquet, and, you know, we've, we've discussed disc golf. And I can't see, you know, with the level of interest the archery range has, why why any of those things would even be considered uh, ahead of the archery, you know? Um, we spent a lot of money on bocce and, uh, you know, there really aren't that many people there compared to the number of people I think we would have interested in the archery range. Yeah, so Don, on the proposal that we have and the plan that we have, it talks about the, the cost and the, and the location being out at the old quarry site. That I didn't know that we had a location. Well, I think originally when we were discussing it was to have it out at that quarry site, that 162 acres or mm -hmm. you know, river and however that would set up. But I think that's part of the discussion that we need to have is to really identify a location that would work for an archery range and then the second part of that is there is a club that runs bocce and there is a club that runs lawn bowling right so when their fee is paid and they show up for league play they're compared or their names are submitted to the poa so that we can ensure that they've paid their dues in order to play that so i think what we need to do in terms of fleshing out the archery proposal is to figure out how operations might look in terms of how we would operate it in order to pay for um, the supplies or, you know, will it pay for itself? Will it be something that will have to be, um, you know, supplemented by assessments? I understand that. And of course, I realized that uh, the club that was intended to run it was the Rod and Gun Club. Which and they went... And, and they went that way because we didn't have anything like the archery range or a gun range or anything, which right. would have made that club successful. But without any of that, that club is gone by the way. Right. Yeah, so I think as we start to talk about capital next month, um, having this discussion on the archery range and an actual proposal in terms of operations will make a difference on, on how you present it to the administrative staff and the board in terms of, right. okay. it is on the three-year capital budget and I think it's in 2022 right now. Um, and so just like we've done the last few years, um, you lobby the other people on the committee to move it into what you think it should be in. And then we send it on up the chain and, and then we figure out where the money lies in terms of, of who gets what kind of stuff. So no, I, I, I agree with you. It's been on the horizon. There is an interest every year. There are people who contact the office who are looking for an archery range. We do have some areas in the village that would lend itself much more easily to an archery range than others. Um, but I think Don, if, if you're wanting to move that up in terms of capital, then we probably need to have a discussion on how we would 
um, how we would operate it to ensure that it covered its expenses. Right. Okay. Uh, Jim? No, I don't have anything. And Mary? Uh, nothing new. Okay. Um, relative to pickleball, um, as was mentioned earlier, there is social distancing and there's uh, masks worn on the, uh, um, at the points required. Um, it's a whole new world for the pickleball players to go through reservations and uh, only play with those four or five people with whom you uh, signed up. So that's, that's been a, a challenge in, in that respect, but it's been wonderful to get out on the courts, but we also recognize the, the uh, conditions of the courts. And I understand they're, they're going to start the repair on Friday. Is that correct, Stacy? I have, um, on my calendar, I still show May 7th, the week of May 17th. I don't have a specific date, Holly. Unless you oh, I, I believe they're coming Friday because I had to cancel. Um, okay. I, I had made a reservation for Friday and I got a call that they're going to be in uh, okay. repairing on Friday. So I heard they were coming in around the 17th. I didn't hear a specific date from Charlie yet. And I was working on a project this morning. So I was kind of incommunicado for a few hours trying to get that completed. And so if they're coming in on Friday, I believe Carla said it would take her a few days, two to three days. And then we really, we would like, and Jim and I have talked about this in the past. She says you could play on them within 24, but we'd really like to see a 72 hour dry window on that epoxy that they're gonna be using. Um, so we would be down about six days total. Of course, you could open some courts earlier than others because she'll have those completed earlier days than others. So we'll, we'll be working all of that based on each of the courts that she completes. Okay, good. Uh, and hearing that, um, yeah, that'll have to be worked out because people are making reservations now. So yeah, right. Holly, yeah. Yes. Holly, uh, I just got an email from Greg. It says outdoor co courts will be closed Friday the fifteenth, sixteenth, seventeenth for repairs. So yeah, see, they aren't. That's what I had heard too. So I don't know where he got it, but it just came out. He got it from Sarah, who got it from. Gil, maybe, or whomever's, or probably Charlie. Okay, well, whatever. Because that's what Sarah told me also. So, um, thinking of the extra days, I guess we got to work on that, Stacy. The seventeenth may include the dry time, though, on those some of those courts. So you may reopen whatever she finishes on the fifteenth. You could reopen by the seventeenth or the eighteenth. You could reopen on the eighteenth. The one she finishes on the sixteenth. You could reopen on the 19th. So like I said, some of them would reopen uh, sooner than others. So other than those three days, while we might have to limit more people who play or the fewer courts that we have, we could certainly still keep people playing outside of those three days. Yeah, I agree with Stacy. I think you need 72 hours on that apostle. Yeah, yeah. I, I would think, um, yeah, we just have to get it in the schedule. And the only other um, comment relative to pickleball is it, it is difficult with new players. That, that's very clear. We had a couple, uh, I think it was yesterday, and they ended up playing alone. They don't know anybody. So it, it's just a, a, a new way of doing things, and um, it's, it's a little awkward for, for the group. But it's fun to be on the courts, too. So we'll get there. And lest you forget... Um, we still need a cover. Yeah, I, I haven't forgotten. And Holly, I think, I don't know if you can see him or not, but I think Mr. Garrison has his hand. No, I can't see him. Okay, he has a question. Okay. I have a pickleball question. What was the date that you're going to expand the parking there? Two questions, actually. So we started the, originally we were hoping to do that, Dick, in April with everything that went on. Jason Temple had a meeting with his staff in streets and in grounds today to talk about an, ex an expansion, most likely in September timeframe, but he has not set a specific date for that yet. Um, he is 
he is going to get with me a date so that we can plan that around a, another pickleball tournament that's planned this fall. Is that a um, recreation capital budget or a grounds capital budget? It's in the grounds capital budget for the parking lot. Okay. And Holly, the one thing I did want to say about pickleball, and I've had a couple of people who have called me, those reservations are required because we have to be able to do contact tracing for the Department of Health. So I yeah, just I understand. Yeah, I just wanted to take this opportunity so the rest of the Recreation Committee understood, you know, at fitness and at tennis and at golf, you know specifically who's in each foursome or who's on each court or who's walking in the fitness center. We had to do the same thing at Pickleball to do contact tracing for the Department of Health. So we had to know who was on each court, who was in the court next to them, who stood in line when they were registering that whole thing so we could provide that contact tracing. Yeah, no, it was understood. In fact, it was a very real understanding this morning because we had five in our group. Another group came in and they only had three. And we said, well, we only need four if you want to go, but you got to get permission. And that was exactly what happened was that yeah. she got recorded with the other group. Well, she's recorded with bo both groups. So because she was exposed when in your exactly. In, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that um, it, it's working. Uh, it, we're, we're, we're not planning on it being a permanent thing, though. <laughs> we'll call it the new normal and hope to get back to the old normal as quickly. Yeah, I, I don't do new normal anymore. <laughs> okay, any other comments? Let's go on to old business, please. So, subcommittee update. I, I, I tried to interrupt there, but I guess I didn't do it correctly. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's fine. Um, I, I guess I would like, and I guess Dick might want it too, and a little bit of an update. The last I heard, we were doing core drilling or something at the pickleball courts, and now we're just going to patch it or what's going on there. I guess I'm – can I get up to speed a little bit on that maybe? Yeah. Jim, do you want to you wanna go over some of what we've talked about? And um, Jim, and for those of you guys who don't know, Jim is, is a member of the Recreation Committee, but is a – a current and or former guru of concrete. Um, and I'll let you go into the rest of that, Jim. And, and if there's anything, you know, I'll, I'll jump in, but I'll let you tackle that. Yeah, well, the short story is that, uh, you know, Nova wanted uh, the moisture content of the concrete. And uh, right now for outdoor courts, there is no accepted uh, mechanism to get that information, okay? Core drilling <clears throat> was, and I thought we could do that too, but uh, you core drill either with water or you do it dry. If you do it with water, it adds moisture to the, the core that you pull out. And uh, if you do it dry, the bit gets real hot and that uh, actually takes out the moisture so you don't get a good reading. And uh, therefore, there is no good uh, test for outdoor uh, relative humidity that's in, in the uh, concrete. So <clears throat> what Stacy had done is get the uh, cesium carb uh, chlorine test, which is for indoor, to give her an idea of what's in there. And we do have that data. So we're not going to be doing core drilling. At this point in time, the only choice we have is to fix it I think the uh, damage that we have and then uh, we'll try and figure out what we're going to do if uh, it comes up again and uh, we may have to do uh, a whole new uh, cover you know so I think it's the best way approach at this point in time. Is that is that under warranty I guess? Well, I was going yeah, to say to add to add to that, so we laid the surface in September of 2018. That's when our warranty began. It has a three-year warranty on it, which goes until um, the end of August of, of 2021. This will be the second repair that the contractor has come back out to make where uh, bubbles and, and lines have appeared. Um, Nova, who is the product that we're using, it's a cushioned surface that we chose to use on it because of the population that we have. It's good on your, much better on your knees. 
Uh, we didn't go with a clay surface like we have at our tennis courts because it requ clay requires a lot of maintenance and we were looking for a maintenance-free product at Pickleball. The product that we have there, and, and Jim has been the one who's mentioned this, we have um, cracks, we have cuts in the concrete that if moisture were coming up, you would normally see them in those cuts in the concrete. And that's not where we're seeing the moisture come up in. The moisture is coming up in the middle. Um, it required as part of the contract a 15 mil um, vapor barrier, which we did install as part of that um, construction project. So we've met all of their standards in terms of construction and they've not seen this before or they've told us they've not seen this before. And Jim and I have had that conversation as well. Um, and in fact, Jim and I had a, a two hour conversation last week on short term solutions is to have the contractor come back in, repair the bubbles that have appeared with a new epoxy product that wasn't used during the original construction. Where this epoxy has been used in the past, we're not seeing issues anywhere else on the courts in those areas. It doesn't mean though that these bubbles might not appear in a different area because now this area of the court has been repaired with a different type of epoxy. One of the long-term solutions, so one of the things that Jim and I discussed on that, on that call last week was if, if short-term this doesn't work and we need to come up with a long-term solution we have a couple of options. We can peel back the cushion surface. We can um, affix this epoxy on the entire court surface and lay the, the, the cushion back down. We can also take up this cushion surface um, and lay this epoxy down, or put, take up the cushion surface, blast it all off, and just paint the surface. Then that allows the, then there's, the cushion surface is what is trapping the moisture between the concrete and the cushion surface. It doesn't allow the water vapor to escape. And so what we're trying to do, there could be, there could be all sorts of reasons for it. It could be subterranean water. It could, it could be, you know, outdoor courts. We could have the rain that we've had this year. We've had two years of more rain than we've seen in the last 10 years. So there are lots of, of reasons for why it might be happening. And this epoxy that we're fixing on it right now, we may never have bubbles again. So while we're under warranty, we're looking at, at going ahead and doing the repairs that we have. Um, and, and Jim, you know, that's something you and I have discussed especially is let's go ahead and fix what we have now, see what kind of solution we get out of it. And then if we need a long-term plan, that's what we're planning for now. Yeah, and there's the epoxy. I'm sorry. Yeah, the epoxy. One thing you have to keep in mind, you know, if we get a really hot summer, you know, the uh, temperature on the top of that uh, cover will be anywhere from 100 degrees to 140 degrees with that sun hitting on it. And if we got more vapor coming up, that's when it's going to show. You know, so we, uh, by doing this, we will see how bad it is, you know, and we may get a lot more bubbles or maybe the uh, moisture will go someplace else, but uh, I don't think so. But uh, I think we're gonna have more problems actually, but uh, we really don't know because we can't figure out how to uh, mo uh, measure the moisture content in the concrete, so. Well, I don't, I'm, of course, everybody has an opinion, but I, I've done a little checking myself. Uh, but, but anyway, they, so if, if it doesn't work out, they're gonna pull it off and then we're gonna go back with an epoxy under the warranty. It, would the epoxy been a, a tremendous amount cheaper than to start with? I mean, where, where are we going to, uh, we, we paid for something. It sounds to me like this was this much money, but we're getting something that was a lot less in the end result if we're not careful. Who's this talking? This is Tucker. Oh, Tucker, I didn't know you were on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, right now, you know, in my mind, you know, you look at the, their literature, and it says very clearly that uh, if you think you have a vapor problem, the first coat you put on should be an epoxy coat. And so I think uh, we can use that against them if have to, but uh, I think they have some liability there. Yeah, I just hate for us to end up with a product, a lesser product than we paid for just because we're letting them off the hook. And it, it sounds to me like from everything I've seen and little research I've done, it's, it's, it's and I've been in the industry, building industry, most of my life, uh, 
everything I see, it directs to their, the responsibility lays with them, not us. Well, I, I tend to agree with you, but you know, we need to prove that, you know, and I think if we put this pox in, it doesn't show up in those areas, but it does other areas, then uh, I think they have the, uh, oh, the, the whole thing. Well, I guess, and I agree with you, we have to prove it, but I, I'm more in line to think they have to prove otherwise herself, not us. We've done, we did everything they required us to do. If, if it wasn't prepared correctly, they shouldn't have put it down. Well, you know, what, what they're going to do now is what will prove it, I think. So that they are doing it. Okay. We're not, we're not paying for anything. So who is Tucker? Uh, I'm a, a, a board member. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I was invited to the meeting. That's all I'm, you know, so. <laughs> well, board members can, yeah, all board members can always attend. It's just on their screens, they can't see you, Tucker, until you start talking. And then they didn't recognize your voice. Okay. Didn't sorry, I don't have a picture. Yeah. It was like, okay, <laughs> where's that coming from? It's, I'm not, it, it doesn't show up on here. I see y'all. I see all of y'all. I see him and I see a Tucker raised hand in front of me. So yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I did that earlier and then I so I'll unraise my hand or lower hand. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I, tried, I tried that earlier, so very good. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, let's go to the subcommittee updates, Coronado Center deliberative engagement. So we talked at the last meeting that we're holding off on those until we can actually get people back into the facilities. So now that the governor has released that May 18th, you can bring in groups up to 50. And our roundtables are typically anywhere between 30 and 50 and decide if we want to begin to reschedule those groups that we haven't had an opportunity to meet with yet. So the first group that we would be meeting with are the renters of the Coronado Community Center. Um, it would have to be a little differently. So we, instead of having four or five meetings in one night at round tables with each of you guys facilitating a table, what we might have to do instead is have several dates limiting the number of people, putting them in a single room, and then just having some one-on-one -on -one conversation. So maybe Serena would do it on a Monday night and Jim would do it on a Tuesday night. And, you know, so we could certainly begin moving forward that way, or we can wait until we can get everybody back in the room again. So I guess I'm just kind of looking for a consensus on what you're thinking there. When is the occupational study due? August? August. Tammy, you had a question. Well, no, it wasn't a question, it was a comment. So if we don't go back to do this, we're not gonna make the August. But the last step was we were doing community-wide and I don't see that that's gonna be possible right now and maybe not for a while. Yeah, you're right. But I also think because of um, COVID-19 and expenses and capital budgeting, where Serena, yes, it was due in August for us to try to budget for 2021. Mm -hmm. be looking at having to push this off a year of course yeah in you know in order to any capital that's not expensed this year because we're holding those expenses would certainly need to be rebudgeted before we discussed anything that needed to be spent at Coronado Community Center doesn't mean that we're not going to continue if the roof should leak or an HVAC unit goes out we are still using that building we'll still you know, keep that building up and maintain it as a rental facility for options to members and, and their guests. But it just means that instead of being, uh, instead of having a proposal ready for this year, we'll need to hold that off and put that out into 2021. I think at that point, you probably want to hold off on doing the uh, engagement series too. Okay. Um, because you don't have any uh, people will wonder what, what happened with that. And, uh, okay. I think it would be really hard trying to engage one-on-one -on -one to get people to talk. They tend to start talking when somebody says something, then that reminds them of something, and then that gets the ball rolling. Okay. Okay. I was just looking for some sort of 
you know, this is certainly being run by the committee. And so I wanted a kind of a feeling from you guys on, and I agree with that. I think Tammy's right. It's very hard to get people to engage one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. They, they, they feed off each other in terms of concepts, especially when we're talking about, you know, what would they like to see? Um, and if we do all of the prep work now and then come back six months later and try to do this huge public engagement, there's no connection to the individual meetings that we had. I mean, we're still going to have a bit of that disconnect, um, but we have all the reports from all the other roundtables that we've run on Coronado Center, um, and we'll be able to provide all of that information. And then it, during the public input, people will have the ability to, I know Tammy's got a guest on her desk, will be able to um, bring forth that information, but also let the community bring forth new ideas that maybe weren't even on the table when we were talking about it back in in September of, of 2019. So. so Holly, with consensus from the committee, then we'll just kind of put that on a holding and until we kind of get out of these phases of reopening. Yep. Okay, and we talked about um, initiating or reinitiating again site visits um, to be determined. We thought uh, it would make sense to do the outdoor rec next um, since it is outdoors and we could do social distancing and in, in uh, June. Um, but uh, as it gets closer um, to that date, um, you'll notify the committee, right? And maybe have yes. the meeting down there at the um, pavilion at the multi-purpose room. No, well, at, so the, this... um, at the Bocce Lawn Bowling Dog Park area. The building. Yes. There. So the outdoor recreation Bocce Lawn Bowling Dog Park site visit is going to be scheduled for June 8th. We can certainly take that in terms of socially distanced. Um, taking a look at those facilities. Remember, there is a bathroom facility that is on the deferred maintenance list to be replaced in that in that DeSoto Park area. In 2020, we've held that construction project right now. It is a $70,000 expense that is being held as part of non-essential spending. Um, it would most certainly need to be rebudgeted if not built in 2020. You guys have seen the structure before, but we'll certainly took a, take a look at it again as part of that walkthrough. We'll look at the new bocce lanes. We'll look at the lawn bowling court. Um, and in a second, we'll, we're going to talk about croquet. We can also look at the area in which Darren has suggested for a croquet area. Whether we can have the meeting there or not will depend on what the social distancing guidelines are in place on June the 8th or as right. we get closer to that date. So we can determine time based on whether or not we'll have to come back to another facility or doing an online a Zoom meeting. I can tell you with Coronado Center reopening on May the 18th with less than 50 people, I expect for those of you who are able to join in person, that our June meeting will be held back at Coronado Community Center. And for those of you who still prefer to attend by Zoom, we'll do both. We'll set up um, a Zoom meeting so that you can participate. Um, for the, and for those of you who would like to participate in person, more than likely our June meeting will be back over at Coronado Center. We'll still probably have some social distancing um, and limits on the number of people who can attend the meeting in the rooms that we're in but getting back face-to-face, -face, I think, helps us have that discussion. Okie doke. COVID-19. So, uh, yeah, so welcome to a pandemic. Um, I've already kind of talked about what our revenues are down, our expenses, we're holding non-essential we have kept our employees working either uh, by right reassignment or within their facilities. When you do visit the fitness center, you will see some changes here. Uh, we made changes that we typically reserve for our August deep cleaning dates. We went ahead and made some of those changes. Uh, we uh, made some corrections in the men's locker room. We made um, paint um, women's locker room. We painted in the pool area. Uh, we've deep cleaned the carpets. So things that we normally do as part of that cleaning, uh, we did while we were closed and we were able to use POA staff to do that, which saved labor costs that we would normally incur later on. 
Some of those staff members were assigned to public safety. Some were assigned to the golf department. So they were assigned that as well so that those who wanted to continue to work were given the opportunity to do so. Other than that, we've held all capital spending in the recreation department, except for the deck furniture that was already in process for the indoor and outdoor pools. Um, that, and that was a $15,000 expense split between those. Um, that's the only capital project that we've moved forward with in the recreation department as of May 11th, 2020. Okay, any other old business? Moving right, right along, new business. First up is the croquet discussion. And I know Stacy sent out the proposal from Darren Watson. By the way, I thought it was very nicely done. Uh, really walked through a lot of um, questions I had. Uh, and to me, it sounded like a, a great opportunity for the recreation and an amenity that is not very expensive and yet um, could be enjoyed by a more senior group as our lawn bowling and bocce ball and, and young group too, as far as that goes. Um, and the, the one question I had is um, storage. If we, if in fact it went to the, uh, lawn bowling and bocce area, which made a lot of sense to me, um, if there was some place in that structure that we could also store their equipment. And that might be getting ahead of things, but just to talk about something. When you guys reviewed the proposal from, from Darren, were there other questions that you had in terms of his proposal? I had, if no one else does, I have some comments. Okay, Serena. Um, I love croquet. And it's um, an amenity that I asked about when we moved here two years ago. So I'm, I'm pro having it. Um, in some ways, it would only require a small amount of money right now if we don't build a court. Um, and, and maybe possibly we could squeeze that into the budget. Um, or maybe we are going to be so far behind the budget that we can't do it this year. But putting all of that aside, um, I, I can see the efficacy of putting it, locating it in the dog park bocce area. Um, there will already be bathrooms there if, if we do certainly move forward with the storage and bathroom facility. And at this point, we could probably add on a slight additional storage space for the croquet. Uh, I guess my concern, if there are any, is that we put so many amenities in that DeSoto area and we don't spread them across the village to be accessible or as accessible to everyone. Um, we would have to perhaps look at the old bocce ball court area near Coronado. Perhaps that's something that we could put there. Uh, some questions is, would we actually go with natural gas, grass, sorry, <laughs> with natural grass and then have to maintain it? Um, croquet requires a very specific kind of grass and a short cut grass field. Um, or if there is indeed enough interest, would we do an AstroTurf type um, croquet installation. And that led me to kind of some different thinking that would be maybe more cost effective right now. In the past, um, I know Stacy, you talked about possibly doing something with that green field space near the Cortez Pavilion. And we talked about just having an open green space or community green space um, that people could use for some different activities. And I wonder if it would be more efficient than, especially right now, instead of determining that yes, there is enough interest in a croquet club um, and enough volume of participants to actually warrant the dollars spent locating it, um, a, a nice quality facility, perhaps in the dog park area. But what is the possibility of just simply creating a nice green space, a community green space 
um, where people can do a different, uh, can they could play croquet. Um, they could bring their own mallets and their own wickets and they could set up the course in any way that they wanted and play croquet. They could even play some disc football. We've had some people interested in disc golf and we weren't ready to move forward with that, but certainly a nice place where you could throw the Frisbee and maybe even play um, some Frisbee sports. Um, you know, racket toss is something that people can play and enjoy, but we don't have a large enough flat green space or badminton or volleyball. So is it possible for a small amount of money this year or going into next year just to develop a community green space where people can play a variety of games? And then we could determine if there is consistent adequate volume of participation in any one sport like disc golf or like archery or like croquet that it would actually um, be worth investing the money of a dedicated space just for that one sport. And that way in the interim until the volume is achieved, interested people could play in that green space for free. Um, it could be more organized sports or it could be family and child play. Um, and I think that would give us a better read on what would actually be the return on investment in our dollars spent if we had some way of measuring the actual interest and in continued sustained participation and the volume of that participation in any of those sports before we spend any money in any one of them. I'm done. <laughs> any other comments about croquet? Serena, would you be interested if I were to schedule a meeting with uh, Mr. Watson? Uh, would you be interested as a committee representative to sit in on that conversation? Because I, like you, had a few questions. You know, what specifically was the request from the Recreation Department and the POA in terms of, was he looking for us to purchase, you know, the, the, um, the wickets and the clips and the mallets and the balls? Was he just looking for us to prepare a court layout? Um, you know, what was that court layout? What's the maintenance going to be? Remembering that grounds maintenance out of the Public Services Division is responsible for all of our grounds maintenance. What would those ground needs be? How much time? What kind of money would we be looking at in terms of prepping a surface? You know, where 40 by 50 doesn't sound like a lot, it's 2,000 square feet of grass seed or sod or that has to be maintained. You can't have sod if you don't have an irrigation system and now right. you've lost in an irrigation system and RPZs and, you know, everything else kind of goes with that. It sounds great if you just have a spot that you can go out and play. I think another location that might be considered is Grove Park. You have the wide open area. I don't know if it's 40 by 50. And, and I don't know how level, you know, the area over at Soto Park is not quite level. The area over at Grove Park is not quite level, but Grove Park does then get, you know, at least spaced out in terms of the amenities that we're looking to add. And, and so would you, Serena, would you be interested, you know, as a committee rep to, to kind of maybe have a conversation with Mr. Watson and myself and kind of see where we go from here in terms of, you know, if, if there's a cost associated what is that cost and where does that fall in the? <coughs> yes. Okay. Is there anybody else that would like to participate in that meeting? Okay, the two of you. Well, I, I feel the rest of us the first time, Holly, so that's why I didn't figure anybody was interested. <laughs> I'm sorry? I said no one spoke up initially with questions, so I wasn't sure if anybody yeah. other than Serena had played croquet. So hey, I'm just checking to see if anybody's holding back with their mallets or something. I know, Tammy. We played, we played last comment. week, but the ground was too thick. We, we one place to begin with, and then we moved, and it was too thick, and it was tilted, and you couldn't play. You know, so you either have to have a green space with well manicured lawn or turf or turf. Um, so it requires some additional consideration. So Serena, you're willing to you're willing to approach one of the golf course superintendents and use their putting greens for croquet? I actually, when we first moved here, I asked about croquet, and then I was referred to Charlie Brown, and I said, "Oh, well, I haven't been to the lawn bowling courts, but I understand there's some space. Could we do it there?" And he was like, "Oh." <laughs> 
croquet set that I play in the back of my yard. <laughs> When the grandkids. Would be, yeah, but in addition to, I'm totally not opposed to croquet. I'm very much in favor of it. I don't know that it's certainly not essential this year, and our, our money is very limited right now with the COVID 19 situation. But it would be certainly nice, maybe to have at some point down the road a formal croquet location. But in the interim, I think a green space where people could play a variety of sports just as friends or with their kids and begin the introduction to the sports. And we could use that as a way to determine sustained participation and, and help us determine what our actual ROI would be on the investment and whether we should actually, you know, build something or not. You know, we didn't build the pickleball courts immediately. So, you know, the pickleball court had to, um, show some interest from the club and, and some dedication and some skin in the game. So I think it would be nice to have a green space where people could just wake it out and play, at least in the interim. Tammy, you had a comment. Yeah. How big is that green space at Coronado? Do we know? The old Bocce. Coronado? You mean the old Bocce lane? Oh, at Cortez. 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 Oh. It's probably a, it's a good 100, 120 feet by 60 or 70. And that's my best guess, just picturing the space. The only problem there is the lake. You're throwing a Frisbee or you're throwing anything else. There's a good slope down to the water. Um, and so, Don. Yeah, I am. Um, it's used as overflow parking for events that you have there at the Cortez area too, because that is a small parking lot and there's no way to park on the streets. And so if you've got an event of any kind, you end up using that area for parking. There's no other location to use. That would Especially take care for of the green. fishing tournaments. Oh, I had another question when it comes to archery. I understand that there's an ideal way to design an archery section, but is it possible if we had a large green space that you could put um, archery or portable archery at one end of it so that it could be used in the coming months and then again determine the actual level of interest and participation in that which would inform um, perhaps building a nicer archery location in the future. Serena I think the biggest thing on archery and, and Don will certainly correct me if I'm wrong um, the length of, of the, the field in which you're going to shoot and then what's behind the targets. Right. I, I think those are gonna be the two biggest things. Croquet, when you talk about a green space, is a much smaller and limited space than what you would probably need in terms of archery. Well, you, uh, you need at least 50 or 60 yards straight away, and you need backstop. Right. You, you, can't, you have to have some kind of backstop. Um, and, and, and something on the sides too. Yeah, you can't have kids running in the way of it. Obviously. Oh, no, no. Yeah. yeah. It has to be so covered. on a green space, which I think is a great thing, but if it's, it would be nice to have a green space, a flat green space. I remember the first group that came and, and wanted us to do the pool off of where um, 19 is on DeSoto and you know move it over there and then they were talking about taking the area and making it a really nice big green space in there and something like that would be very nice but I think it would have to still be either a really large space or it would have to be designated or able to be like Mondays is croquet and Tuesday because otherwise you're going to get people that want to go play. You still have to reserve it. Yes. 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 And, and you know, they've got croquet people there. And so badminton on the Wednesdays from three to four or three to yeah. five and then you can't, anyone else can't use it during that time. Yes. It would right, have to be reserved right. and designated. Otherwise, we'd be like those West Side gangs. Yeah. So, Tammy, does that mean you want to come on board with Serena in order to talk with Mr. Watson um, about the use of a green space? Or are you, you're still You know what? Talk to him about croquet, and then we get to a green space, and I would be glad to be on it and, and work on that, you know, what it would look like and what all we could use. Because badminton, kids, rolling hoops, there's a whole bunch of stuff that would be really nice to have. Okay. 
Tucker has raised his hand, I see. <laughs> I'm back again. Yes. Uh, I know it's probably a dumb question, but whatever happened to the softball field? I mean, I don't know what I don't know what we've done over the years in the village. I know I've been here forever, but we're, what's at the what is now at the old softball field? So no, the bocce ball field, that's bowling. bocce ball and lawn bowling. Okay, so that has been utilized. Okay, yeah, both of those um, have been put there. We're obviously landlocked for some degree here, uh, but I do know where some more property would be available uh, to us down the road in the village uh, over behind the uh, the levee by Balboa Dam. I don't know if you're familiar with the area, but if you know where the golf cart barn is at Magellan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then you know where there's a subdivision there, a little townhome, duplex townhome subdivision. Uh, Cooper still has all that land there and it would be available to us. Um, I did check on some of it here a while back. I don't know if you remember, they were going to put in a, a garden center. Does anybody yeah. remember that? Yeah, yeah. community uh, garden. Yeah, we had, I, I was able to get the land donated to the POA for that had, had we taken it from Cooper. We elected not to do it later on, but just FYI, it's all floodplain property. So it can't, Cooper has really no use for it and they're just paying taxes on it. But the uh, floodplain didn't mean you couldn't have a lot of uh, recreation there. Something to think about for future. And it's flat. A lot of it is, you know, you'd have yeah. to do some work on it, but it's not, not saying you couldn't even get that maybe donated in a situation, you know, you never know. Um, just a thought. Yeah, that's a good thought. Yeah, so moving it um, someplace a little bit more central. Uh, just to just to throw it out there, as long as we're having discussion, there is still some continued interest that by the same people um, in disc golf. It, it's continually being mentioned um, as an area of interest, and there's recently been um, a lot of um, chatter on next door about starting a community garden. Um, well, there's, and, there's a lot of there's a lot of area there. I looked it over yeah. when we were. And there's there. a lot of pros and cons for doing that, and that would be at some additional expense that we probably don't have the money for right now. But just letting you know that there's some interest, continued interest in it. There's a lot of land there that 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 could be in a great location, you know, for for recreation. Would it be able to have, I think that the neighborhood there had a, a complaint about, they didn't want the, right. you know, community garden. Is there enough land to do like a buffer zone in between yep. where you would do the green space and, and so the, that way it wouldn't affect them? Yeah, the complaint was due to that. That's not where they decided to put it. At, at, after the research was done, um, they elected not to go that route and they were going to go on the other side of that subdivision, which was really tight. If, I don't know if you're aware of it, there's an additional, I won't call it a spillway, but a, an area where the, the lake could drain in floodplain situations there at the other side. And, and the POA had decided they wanted to put it there, which was on common property. Uh, and I guess they started complaining about it and obviously it went away. Um, but, uh, but yes, there's plenty of room to be, I mean, you could do it all the way back up to the Magellan Golf Course storage area there, and they, that's plenty, plenty far away, you know. So it'd just be a matter of how, much, how close we wanted to get to them with what we needed to do. We could start at the other end, work that way, and then and go as far as we, you know, use what we could use later down the road. And I'm talking years down the road, you know, whenever the money's available to do stuff like this. But the problem's always gonna be, we're landlocked. We really need to consider that for 10 years from now. I say landlock, we're out of land. We don't have any land. Yeah, and that area has a, a fairly large flat area that you, you could, and I guess that's the secondary spillway. Uh, well, that area, I don't think we can use. I've, I've, I've questioned our, our thinking we could do that because that's common property and we, we're, oh, yeah, we can't build on, we, I think, we can't build. I, I, I think water has been over one time since I've lived here. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not re talking in relation to that. I'm talking in relation to common property to build on that. Yeah. Oh, we yeah, we will, can. we will, we will get restricted real quick there. But this other has not been zoned yet. So if we we uh, purchased it for a dollar from Cooper, uh, we could zone it recreation uh, commercial. 
and that would that would uh, that would eliminate any, any of our problems from a zoning situation. Well, if it's usable, if we can do it, I love free, and uh, do a simple improvement on it and put you know croquet or badminton, some things like that that people could do. Well, and I say free, it was free, you know, I, I, I did get a section of it, but I have a lot of confidence that I could, I could pull that off again, but I may not, but I'm fairly confident I can. That would be something good to jump on, because that would be a good place maybe to put a park in later with playground equipment, you know. It, I think John would want a long range. Yeah, I think John would want a long range plan to pull off the whole area, but he was more than more than happy to give a give away the uh, the uh, section that we were asking him about anyway. He did ask for the timber off of it, uh, which would be nothing but a benefit for us to get it out of there. So maybe we should uh, suggest a committee to look at that, Stacy. Yeah, we can do that as part of that capital plan as yeah. we discuss those uh, future projects. Mm -hmm. Great. Great to know. That would be interested in it because that's a fairly large area if I'm think, isn't it? I'd be interested in that. that I would definitely be interested in. There's two I'd pieces of property down there that are listed as commercial property for sale on Remax's <laughs> So where they you have the same posting where the Cortez Beach is listed. They also have two fairly large pieces of property there. I think 35 acres and 25 acres around that behind between the DeSoto Beach and the the golf maintenance shed along where the Balboa Trail area is. So Tucker, I don't know if that's the same area. I don't know if 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 that's a different piece of property than the two they have listed yeah. right there. Because when they I, posted think them, I looked at them in terms of the trails committee and, and where that trail is. Yeah, I think, I, I don't hold me to this, but I think that the, the land that I'm referring to is all in a floodplain. And mm -hmm. basically it has no value to, to, to sell to anybody because you can't build anything on it, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, it's just, it, it just it has to be left green space. And I'm not saying we couldn't build a bathroom facility there. Uh, I'm saying we couldn't get insurance on it. Okay. And which we all know there's the chances of that levee breaking and flooding that area. Okay. Yeah, so Holly, I've, I've added that to the subcommittee for capital once we get them established. Yeah, great. And Don uh, volunteered to be on that also. He did, I, I think I heard him volunteer to lead it. Okay. Yeah. On that subcommittee, huh? <laughs> Thank you, Don. Okay, and we did, uh, does that end our croquet discussion, I think? Uh, we did yes. uh, receive an email about uh, a shoreliner on Coronada who was, would like us to consider a pavilion just like um, the one at Cortez and Balboa. Did you send that out also, uh, Stacy? I did. Yeah, that email. Okay. Tom has Tom Paprocki has his hand up. I don't see that. Uh, well, one his comment, physical hand. One comment on this, as opposed to the previous correspondence we got, the only reason I see to build this for these people is because they'd like to have it. I know nothing about its future value to us, if any. Uh, it just. Yeah, and, and, and uh, I don't know, I'd like to have a swimming pool built in my yard. Can you do that for me? Oh, so, you know, we'd like to have a pavilion. Why? So we can be like two other lakes. Yes, Tammy. Was that yeah. over by the boat ramp that they wanted the pavilion? Yes. yes. Yeah, that's, that's in such a, you know, residential area all around in there. I can't imagine we wouldn't get pushback from the residents oh. on putting a pavilion in there. Yeah. 
and it's not a very big space. Do I speak to it? Serena? I live on Coronado, as does Don. <laughs> but I live on Coronado, and I actually belong to the Coronado Shoreliners. Um, they do talk about this quite a bit. We've discussed it in the past. Um, we don't fully utilize the Balboa and Cortez pavilions. And so it isn't a smart financial expenditure, in my opinion, to build a pavilion at Coronado at this time because it would have such little usage. Um, I think the possibly the only usage it would get would be for the shoreliners to use it one time a year for their barbecue. Um, and that doesn't seem to be, um, we wouldn't be very good stewards of all of the residents' um, assessments if we built it just for that reason. Um, the shoreliners themselves seem to be a decreasing number. They're not organized. Um, they haven't even had events this past year. We had um, just two dock meetings, but we did not have the annual barbecue and we did not have the brat fest and we did not have the Christmas party. Um, so there's not, there wouldn't be a big utilization um, of the pavilion. Um, it, it wouldn't necessarily reach capacity because we're not using Bal Balboa or Cortez pavilions um, to their capacity. So that would be kind of a waste of money to build it. And we're also, you know, looking at having these meetings of deciding what we're actually going to do with the Coronado area. Um, I just feel it's something that should be tabled and, and rediscussed at the time when we make plans for Coronado in general. I would agree. I think it falls as Stacy and I talked about in our pre-meeting, I guess, that it probably falls within that Coronado Center area discussion. Yeah, I don't think it's worth considering until like uh, you look at moving the marina and all those other things over there, then, you know, you, you might be looking at developing the area. You're always going to get a lot of feedback from the residents there because it is in the middle of a very residential area. People walk their dogs and take walks up and down the street. So if you increase the traffic flow there, you, you would get a tremendous amount of, of pushback. Tammy, you had a comment with your hand. Yeah, maybe if we put, if we have some, put a couple of picnic tables over there, make it a little bit nicer. So if a family wanted to go out and have a picnic there, they, they would have a place to do that. Um, you know, small gatherings, I've been over there, it's a nice area, and that would be something very inexpensive and nice to have. So a couple of things I will tell you, you know, this was brought up several years ago, um, and everybody who lives in that neighborhood showed up at a recreation committee meeting, because mm. they had heard mm. on a capital plan five or six years out that, that a pavilion was looking to be built there, and so, um, I think all of that, number one, it is a residential road and there is no uh, right of way, nor is there any common property that would allow you to um, enlarge the narrow road that leads to the Coronado boat ramp. There is actually quite a bit of land there, 15 to 20 acres, um, that you could actually, you know, you, there's, once you get to the boat ramp, there is a lot of land there in which to build a pavilion. However, Serena is right. We do not utilize the capacity of Cortez nor Balboa that we have now. Tammy, you're right in that you could do a smaller picnic style pavilion, similar to what we have at the DeSoto Recreation Area. It's on the back side of the building. It's large enough and sits just two picnic tables, but it does have a cover similar to one that we put in during the RV park renovation. I think it was five or $6,000. So um, in response to the request from the property owner, would, the, would it behoove us to have the conversation that says, what size are you looking for? As opposed to, you know, if they we're just looking for a picnic pavilion, there is a trail there, there is a ADA accessible a fishing pier there. We have talked, Don, in terms of moving the boat slips from behind Coronado Center as part of that Coronado Center deliberative engagement over to the boat ramp because it makes a little bit more sense to have boat slips where you have a boat ramp. 
So should we, you know, should we reach out then to the, the email of um, Coronado Shoreliner and say, you know, maybe some additional information in terms of how he plans on or, or what he thinks the use of this pavilion would be and what the size of this pavilion would be. Um, and then bring that back again, Holly, maybe to the subcommittee that's discussing capital um, and see if, if it would then fit with any, any plans that might be coming forth at a future time. I don't see why you wouldn't just be up front with them and say it doesn't look like a financially feasible project at this time. Maybe we'll revisit it in a few years. Okay. That's my feeling on it, but it's up, okay. to, up to you. I would put it with the Coronado whole discussion and. Okay. Yeah. I agree. So Serena, you're, I agree for Holly or Dawn, not financially feasible or put it in with the Coronado discussion. It's not financially feasible at this time and we will put it in with the Coronado discussion. <laughs> she agrees with both. She agree for both, okay. I mean, it's certainly no, there's no, certainly no harm in, in asking specifically what he's looking for. We kind of already know that answer, but we can certainly ask and would be able to keep it in mind for further discussions, but um, it's certainly not essential to the village at this time. Okay. Okay, and item C, outdoor pool memorial brick project. All right, so we originally talked about this several months ago. We were gonna do a kickoff in April with the pool tours. What we're looking to do is to raise um, about half of, um, so let me, let, me, let me back up for a second. We wanted to come forth with a project that would cover about five years of operating costs for the outdoor pool. The way that we were looking to do this is the de development of a a sponsorship package that would include naming rights for the outdoor pool that would cover about half of those five-year operating costs and then to cover the other five years of the operating costs in a uh, commemorative brick project. So there is there is a brick sidewalk that leads out of the DeSoto Club and then just kind of ends in no man's land. Mm -hmm. He built the, uh, the trail, the DeSoto Recreation Trail with the bridge that we replaced when the other one uh, got undermined that leads over to the DeSoto Recreation Area from the outdoor pool. What we could do with the commemorative, the 50th anniversary commemorative bricks is attach the sidewalk from DeSoto Club to the sidewalk that is over at the Family Recreation Area with these, uh, memor uh, not memorials because you don't have to be dead, commemorative of bricks um, commemorating the 50th anniversary year of Hot Springs Village. We were looking to sell the bricks for about a hundred dollars. We have a company who actually takes the orders online, process the bricks, the bricks, and then mails them out once they have um, an order of 250. We could line that out in terms of each section of sidewalk and add specific sections of sidewalk as 250 bricks are available. Uh, to be installed. What I'm looking for is someone from the Recreation Committee. I, guys, give me just one second. I have a police officer at my door. Hang on just a You. Sorry, guys. Um, let me go back to what we were talking about. Someone's gonna have to refresh me because now my mind's on on the bricks. You you were asking the if the memorial bricks. Thank you. Work on the brick project. I do apologize. Uh, the memorial memorial bricks. So what I'm looking for is 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 there someone 
who is interested from the committee on kind of working through that project. There is somebody and we're just waiting. <laughs> we're just <laughs> I can help with it. I don't want to run it, but there we go. And Mary, that'd be fine. I'm just looking for some committee input in terms of, uh, you know, kind of what the community's looking for, what the committee's looking for. Uh, I volunteer. Of, of what that of what that project would look like. So Mary and Dawn, I heard you uh, yeah. there at the very end. So I'll send you the information, the links. What I'd like for you guys to do is evaluate the company that we're looking at using. Um, and then looking at how many bricks and, and all that kind of stuff and just kind of giving me your feedback on the proposal that we've put together in terms of the recreation department. Um, Source some feedback from the, at the committee level to let us know if, if you, you know, if this project and, and the product that we've chosen is something that you think the community would be interested in. Okay. Okay. Yep. All right. Okay. Uh, anything else? I have a question. Do we have volleyball nets at the beach? We used to install them. Um, we, we had one area that we put a volleyball net up every year. And we had beach patrol out there to kind of monitor the balls and how people played. And then we had the year that beach patrol wasn't um, as staffed as it had been in years past. And we had some mishaps where people were getting balls slammed into them and um, we just didn't have as much control over it. And then we um, had last year where we put them up and someone vandalized them. That's what I was thinking, yeah. Yeah, they took the poles and, and pulled them out with a vehicle. Right. We, had, right. we did not reinstall them after the vandals. Um, and it was not our intention to install them this year. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts? If not, I would uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Uh, I second. heard Don. Second. And Mary. Second. Mary, second. We All those in favor? Aye. Hi. Hi. Before everybody goes away, I had a question. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> I had a question. Um, we never have done the the site visit for the pool and um, the pickleball courts and the mini golf. But would it be possible, even if we don't do mini golf and pickleball right now, since the pool is getting ready to open, could we? just have a day that we could perhaps gather there and do a walkthrough before it opens? We should. So we, we can, one of the things is all the furniture is in, but we haven't pl placed it out there yet. Um, number one, vandals. Um, yeah. Didn't want it to walk away in a facility that's not open every day. So we've got- We're not asking about the furniture, but if we could just- Yeah, walk. if you just want to walk through for the pool itself, I'm happy to schedule one either later this week or even next week. As long as we can maintain the six feet of social distance, then yeah. I can certainly meet you guys yeah. out there. We can walk through the facility. Um, uh, the lockers were finally delivered today. We ordered them on February the 18th. Oh wow. Woo. Delivered today. Um, we got caught up in, they sent the wrong package and then we got caught in COVID and then we couldn't get shipping. And then the lights finally shipped out of Mexico last week and were installed on Thursday. So now we can get the audio and the security camera systems in. IT, at and is scheduled to come out this week. So other than that, you know, we, we got pushback in some of those things in terms of construction because of the pandemic. Um, but it is ready for a walkthrough, um, and I'm happy to walk you guys through the project. Can Why we bring our swimsuit? <laughs> Holly, and there were two people talking at once, so Holly, you, you popped up first. Do you want to name a date and time? Sure. Uh, is there a date and time that is not available in terms of a day this week that won't work? Thursday is the only non-rain day forecast. Yes, but I was thinking next week is supposed to be nice. Okay. 
So we could do it Thursday of this week or we could wait and do it next week. Is there a preference? No, I'm, I'm going to be in that area, but between 12 and or between 1130 and maybe 130 or two, I'm doing lunch and putt putt. So okay. uh, I can do it that day, but not during those hours. <clears throat> Would Thursday at nine o'clock, Thursday the 14th at 9 a.m. work for everybody? Yes. Yes. Okay. Anybody it won't work for. Okay, you're on. All right, I'll send out a calendar invitation just as a reminder. Uh, that we'll do the pool walkthrough at 9 a.m. on Thursday, May the 14th. Thank you, Stacy. Furniture for you, Serena, so you can picture it in your mind. Oh, I've, that's okay. I mean, I don't need to see the furniture. <laughs> I just wanted to look at the actual facility itself. I think I've seen the furniture when we um, walk and kayak and walk by the fitness center. It's sitting by the indoor pool, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It is. Uh, I believe we have adjourned again. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I changed the time to 441.